Breaking tonight on a day marked by what looks like a lone wolf terror attack overseas and an ongoing debate about how America has waged the war on terror, we tonight get our first chance to interview the man singled out by a controversial Senate report produced by the Democrats alone and then attacked by some in the media. The man who personally interrogated Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the mastermind of the 9-11 attacks. Good evening and welcome to an extraordinary edition of The Kelly File, everyone. I'm Megan Kelly. We have new details tonight on what may have inspired the lone gunman who staged a dramatic hostage taking in Australia that ended with three dead, including the hostage taker. He was a self-described Islamic cleric who demanded police deliver him an Islamic State flag as he held more than a dozen people at gunpoint. We will get to that later on in this broadcast. But first, tonight, we examine the controversial CIA interrogation report from a perspective you have not heard. Dr. James Mitchell was approached by the CIA in the months after 9-11, asked to help develop a program to get more information from terror suspects. At the time, Intel suggested bin Laden wanted to get a hold of nuclear weapons, and Washington was very worried. Before he was done, Mitchell himself would not only help shape the controversial enhanced interrogation effort, but he was personally part of the team that questioned 9-11 mastermind Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Joining me now, Dr. James Mitchell, who is a psychologist. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, good to see you tonight. Thank you for being with us. You were in the Air Force, then the CIA, 9-11 happened. You were asked to help. How? Well, they asked me to take a look at the uh, Manchester Manual initially and figure out what sorts of, which is a manual that lists their resistance to interrogation strategies, and figure out what sorts of uh, resistance behaviors you might see on the part of detainees. After that, later, they asked me if, if I would uh, look at the behavior that Abu Zubaydah was engaging to see if he was using any of those resistance strategies. So you reviewed the manual, the Manchester manual, that Al-Qaeda was using to teach its own fighters how to resist things like waterboarding and so on. You, you did that, and then at some point, and you suggested means of overcoming that resistance, at some point they came to you and asked you personally to participate in actually conducting the interrogations? Right, that's correct. Uh, uh, what happened was he shut down at one point, in spite of what you hear uh, in the Senate report, he shut down and refused to give any additional Zubeda. information. Zubeda shut down. And they asked uh, me to come back to the uh, campus. And it was clear to me when I was at the campus, listened to what people were saying, that there was so much pressure about trying to head off this second wave that was coming that they were going to use some kind of physical coercion. And so I, uh, I've been spent a lot of time in the Air Force Seer School, and I see what happens when people sort of make stuff up on the fly. And in the course of the conversations, I said, if you're going to use physical coercion, not that you should use physical coercion, but if you're going to use physical coercion, then you could, should use physical coercion that has been demonstrated over 50 years not to produce the kinds of injuries we would like to avoid. All right, let's just step back. The Air Force SEER program is something that you developed, and just in, in a line or two, tell us what that is. Well, I didn't develop it. I was just a part of it. Uh, it's uh, survival evasion, resistance, and escape. escape. It's, it's a program that's designed, really, to teach men and women to... Uh, who are shot down behind enemy lines or taken captive or taken hostage to survive and return with their honor intact. So they had already, the CIA was already conducting interrogations of, of Abu Zubaydah, who worked for bin Laden, who worked for Al-Qaeda, al prior to coming to you and saying, all right, James, we, we're now at the point where we need your help with that? No. I initially went out uh, when Abu Zubaydah was being interrogated by the FBI and CIA and was providing insight into the kinds of resistance behaviors that he was using. All right, let me just jump in. Let, let's just walk our audience through it. So you, you were, were you here in the United States and then asked to fly to this other location to participate in that? Correct. I was here in the United States. And, and can you tell us where you went? <laughs> no, of okay. course not. All right, it was a CIA <laughs> black site where they had him. So you're, you're sitting here. You, you spent a career in the Air Force. You're a psychologist. You, you would evaluate these counterterrorism methods. 
you look at ways to possibly break their resistance to our methods and the next thing you know you're on a plane to go to a CIA black site to participate in the interrogation of one of the worst terrorists we're fighting just I mean as, as a man what, what was that like for you 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 it's not, you land you you walk into the room are you scared are you is he scared what is going through your mind well I'm lost now in terms of which ones you're talking we're starting about. with the very first one which was Zubeda right Right, but I didn't do the first interrogations on Zubeda. Okay, but the, the first one you did, the very first one you did, who was it of? It was the first one I did was of Zubeda. Okay, so I'm just wondering, you as a man, when you walk into this, you know, this room in this remote country, you're, you're a regular guy to this point. I mean, you've been doing intel, but, you know, you're, you're just a man, like any other man. You happen to have a certain area of expertise. What is it like to walk into that room and see this guy? Well, you, it, we were, it was clear that we were going to end up probably having to use physical coercion, and we were hoping that it wouldn't, have, we wouldn't go to that. And it, really, it wasn't that scary. I mean, it, it, was, it was a job um, in, in, in terms of dealing with him. It was like engaging with just about any other person, because uh, once you're into the mix of it, it's not, for me at least, it wasn't a heart you know the coercive part of it I didn't enjoy at all but the engaging with him initially and attempting to get uh, information out of him it was like engaging with anyone else it, I didn't feel any particular thrill it, uh, I didn't feel like I was on a particular adventure it felt like I was working because I was concerned about these attacks that were potentially coming in the second wave I want to tell our audience that up until tonight you have not fully uh, told your story because you've been under a non-disclosure agreement uh, that's been loosened over the weekend and now this is the first chance you've had to really respond directly to this Senate report that was really put out just by the Senate Dems, no, no Republicans. Uh, and so the, this is an extraordinary moment for you to be able to come on camera and tell this story. W when you went into the room, the interrogation room, and of course you'll tell me what you can and cannot say, but how many men on our side were participating, men or women? I'm not allowed to give numbers at all. Okay. So you, were you the one actually conducting the techniques on Abu Zubaydah, or were you in more of a sort of background role? It depends on when you're talking about. Initially, I was in a background role. Then after we shut down and the uh, uh, enhanced interrogations were approved, I, I was in an administration role. I, okay. So d I, did you personally waterboard him? Yes. And are you able to tell us how many men that required to perform that operation? No, I can't tell you anything about numbers. Okay. I understand that when the CIA first told you that waterboarding had been authorized, they, they explained, I assume, the Department of Justice has said this is okay, the White House has said this is okay, Congress has said this is okay. Do I, do I overstate the message? You don't overstate it at all. In fact, uh, he probably won't remember it, but uh, I was in a meeting briefly to discuss it with... Uh, uh, George Tenet and uh, Rizzo, John, Rizzo. The head of the and, CIA and the top lawyer of the CIA. Correct. And, uh, and Tenet turned to Rizzo and said, make sure this is legal before we go forward. I heard him, in a, as he said it, in a private conversation. They were very, very careful to make sure that this thing has been approved. And so the situation that I found myself in personally was one where uh, it was clear that the we had been attacked. It was clear that uh, there was a second wave coming. It w there was all these fears about nuclear devices and anthrax and you know multiple people dying uh, and the catastrophic thing. And there was all this pressure, not just from the CIA, but from Washington and everywhere. Uh, they were saying the gloves are off. You know we ha we have to take extraordinary measures. Uh, that sort of stuff. And. And it was in the context of that that they were putting this program together, and they just wanted to be sure it was legal. And when, and and so, when, you, and when you first administered the waterboarding that had been approved by the DOJ, they had actually approved the number of seconds you could do, uh, pour the water on the person's face, and then the breaks you'd have to take in between. When you did that, did you find that method uh, too severe or too, uh, too light? That actually is a, is a good question because it, it explains one of the issues that I have a problem with that's out in the press. It, 
Well, the OLC basically says you can hold a single water board session for 20 minutes. That means the person can lay on the board for 20 minutes. And then you can administer water for from 20 to 40 seconds, allow the person to get a full breath, and then go another 20 to 40 seconds. But it became clear to me after the first, as not after, but during the first time when we were doing that waterboarding, that that was too much water. So what I did was I reduced the amount of time that we did pours. So for example, if you look at page 76 of the CIA IG report down at the bottom, it says the, uh, that the, the average pour lasted about 10 seconds. So what we decided to do was to do um, lots of very small ones and only a couple of longer ones. We would do two that were 20 seconds and one that was 40 seconds. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to get that far so in you the weeds. But it's interesting result, that you changed the protocol. You, you wound up to, to make it what you, to be less harsh than you were allowed to do. Let me ask you this. Can, wait, wait, let me finish yeah, what I'm ahead. saying. The, the, the net result of that, though, is the number of pours went up. The number of repetitions went up. So when they look there and they say, he was waterboarded 83 times. He wasn't waterboarded 83 times. There were 83 separate pours, and each pour was, on average, about 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. Some were 40 seconds, some were 20 seconds. But we didn't feel that it was, I don't know how to say it any other way, we didn't feel that it was right to use as much water as we were authorized. It, I want, I want to, I'm, we're going to get to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in a minute, but, but sticking with Abu Zubaydah for now, were all of the methods that were recited in, this, in the Senate uh, report employed, like nudity, standing sleep deprivation, the attention grab, the insult slap, were those all used? The ones you mentioned were used. The, the facial grab, the abdominal slap, the kneeling stress position, walling? Walling was used. The, the others, the, what, if, they, if they showed up on the list, they, they were we use we didn't typically use a lot of those stress positions and perf we didn't use any stress positions with those beta because he had an injury okay you know so what happened just so that the people know because this is the thing that the people don't know when they hear is we didn't just go in there and start waterboarding average beta we practiced we got we got briefings from the medical people we practiced the emergency response uh, sponsors that we were going to do. We went through where each person was going to be if there happened to be an emergency. And then, and only then, did we, when we felt that we could do it safely without, you know, causing permanent damage uh, or violating the rules, we did it. That and there was medical personnel in the room? There, there was always medical personnel. There were medical personnel there. There, was, there were psychologists that were independent of the interrogation there. There were, there were uh, uh, language experts, although he spoke English pretty well. There were language experts. There were uh, subject matter experts. And there were, the per there were the people who had the command and control. There was also a traditional interrogation expert, the, you know, traditional law enforcement expert. How many days, need a quick answer on this, we're going to go to break, we're going to come right back with you, but how many days of interrogations did it take to employ all of those methods? Oh, I, I, I actually, it's been so long ago, I don't remember for a specific thing. But, was it several days? Uh, was it a couple of weeks, a couple of months? It was, it was, it was, it was, it was, a, it was at least a couple of weeks. Okay.